All right, good morning, everyone. In uh, today's lecture, we are going to emphasize the function of four major cervical uh, influencing muscles, okay? The first thing I wanna point out is that you have a lot of little intricate uh, intrinsic Intrinsic and extrinsic muscles is simply uh, muscles that are within the joint and then muscles that cross from outside the joint. So uh, think about a uh, little, in it, it kind of sounds what it means, little intrinsic muscles of the hands and the fingers versus extrinsic, big, stronger muscles. So intrinsic are usually smaller, little more detailed muscles. Uh, you have a lot of these in the spine. Uh, not just for individual motion between the cervical vertebra, but also for stability. You know, muscles that connect these two vertebrae together and these two and these two. Those are intrinsic to the spine. Then you have bigger muscles that come and, 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 and cross several vertebrae at once. And those are the ones that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, bigger extrinsic muscles that, that pull on several vertebrae uh, by pulling on the skull. So in other words, if you think about it, if I have muscles that pull on the skull in different directions, it's going to kind of bend the whole slinky up here, okay? So today's uh, lecture is going to emphasize four major muscles that influence cervical motion that you guys are going to be accountable for. Now again, when you go off into graduate school, you may have to learn more intrinsic uh, spinal uh, muscles uh, like longissimus, iliocastalis, spinalis, and, and little rotaries inside the spine. But for an undergraduate uh, biomechanics of muscle function class, I'm just going to give you uh, major players, prime movers as they call them, and teach you how muscles function based on direction of pull, and uh, then you can apply that knowledge to learn more uh, intricate muscles uh, as you guys need as you uh, uh, go uh, through life uh, uh, in this awesome field of kinesiology. So the first thing I wanna point out is that the neck or the, the cervical vertebra, remember in 310 we had cervical motion and then we had trunk motion, trunk being thoracic and lumbar and cervical meaning just the neck, okay? First thing I wanna point out is that these are gliding joints and together the little bits of amphiarthrotic little bits, when you combine all of those little bits, you get an arthritic significant motion with the combination of all the little bits, okay? So basically that's the slinky analogy where you have a slinky and each little rung is a little bit, but when you summate all of those little bits, you get significant slinky motion, okay? The cervical vertebra, all of those little bits of bend can glide, can summate in the sagittal plane or my sagittal plane. So if I'm staring straight ahead, my sagittal plane is here it can glide like this. It could glide frontal. I'll look at you. Glide sagittal, glide frontal, and then glide transverse. Okay. You, if you notice, you get a heck of a lot more overall motion gliding transverse. It's because of those special first and second cervical vertebra, the atlas and the axis. You get most of your motion. So in other words, this isn't a lot not a lot, but whoa, I get a whole 180 degrees because you have a specialty articulation there that gets you a lot of that. And then the rest kind of turn a little bit to summate the rest. It was just a reminder about how that works, okay? So function, how do we talk about function? Function, as you remember, is from the previous lectures, is direction of pull. So we are gonna have muscles that cross the neck in the front anterior that pull in a direction of cervical flexion. Those are gonna be called cervical flexors, not because they always cause flexion, but because they always pull in the direction of flexion. So if you remember, I'm gonna, I, I teach with redundancy. 
in, in a textbook, maybe some of my awesome athletic trainers have a textbook that said, hey, this muscle, this sternocleidomastoid, its function is cervical flexion. Not necessarily. I can have cervical flexion because of back muscles if they're working eccentrically. And these muscles could be responsible for cervical extension through eccentrics. So we got to add that pullers, cervical flexion pullers. Cervical flexors is synonymous with cervical flexion pullers. I mean the same thing. So I'm going to have two main muscles. I'm going to teach you how they work and how we look at the circle that pull anterior, pull the skull anterior in a direction of cervical flexion. Direction of cervical flexion. I have to remember that Dr. Seuss moment. Then I'm going to have muscles posterior that pull in the direction of cervical extension. So I used the sh my shoe. Remember pulling on the string, dorsi flexion, pulling on the heel? So today I have my cap pulling on the anterior part of my cap forward pulls in a direction of cervical flexion. Pulling on the back of my cap posterior pulls in a direction of cervical extension. And that's what's happening here. Posterior crossing muscles are going to pull in the direction of cervical extension. Anterior crossing muscles, cervical flexion. Okay. How would we describe that in a circle? Cross-sectional anatomy. Super simple. The neck is somewhat circular. So if I turn this guy here. Hey, everybody. Somewhat circular. Now, I can't teach you this because you can't see over the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it so that you could see the cross section. Or another way to look at it is if I took the skeleton and laid the skeleton down, you'd be able to see the cross section, right? So this is a cross section of his neck. This is a bilateral axis, one side through the other side. This is the anterior posterior axis, front to back. And this is the polar axis. Anterior, posterior, right lateral, left lateral. Right lateral, left lateral means the right side and the left side. Because remember, when you only have one of something, you don't have literally a lateral on your right and a lateral on your left. You know, your arms have two laterals. You only got, you only got one, so it's the right side and the left side. Lateral and medial for one arm is literally the right of the right, the left of the right, left of the left, right of the left. It gets super confusing, so we say the lateral side and the medial side. When you only have one of something, laterally literally means going to your right or to your left. It's not the right and the left. It's to the right, to the left. It's a 310 uh, concept that I taught you guys. So here's your circle. The muscles that cross anterior are going to pull in the direction of cervical flexion. The muscles that cross posterior pull in the direction of cervical extension. The muscles that cross right lateral... That means, here's the AP axis. These are going to be muscles that cross on the right lateral side, pulling right ear to right shoulder. Not literally, but the side that is on the right ear. And then left lateral, pulling left ear to left shoulder. These muscles that cross right lateral are going to be right lateral cervical benders pulling in the direction of right lateral cervical bending. The muscles that cross left lateral are going to be left lateral cervical benders, pulling in the direction of left lateral cervical bending. Now, to match this up, because you may say, dude, right, left, what? So let me turn him around so that way right and left match up. Okay. Right lateral, right ear, right shoulder, left lateral, left ear, left shoulder. Okay. Now, 
Let's talk about polar. Polar axis. Remember, this is a cross section. So the two directions of motion we have is looking to your right or looking to your left. Right transverse cervical rotation. So we're going to have right transverse cervical rotators or right transverse cervical rotation pullers, synonymous. Left transverse cervical rotators or left transverse cervical rotation pullers. So cervical flexors, cervical extensors, right lateral cervical benders, left lateral cervical benders, right transverse cervical rotators, left transverse cervical rotators. Polar axis, literally think of this as a merry-go-round. Muscles that pull in this direction are trying to spin the merry-go-round this way. And muscles that pull in that direction are trying to spin the merry-go-round the other way. If you're having a tough time seeing this, remember, he's laying down. You're seeing a cross section of the neck. Your supine, so your eyes are facing this way. All right? So, hey, look to the right, look to the left. Muscles that pull to the right in the transverse, muscles that pull to the left in the transverse, okay? So, I'm gonna get to the muscles in a little bit, but I need to teach you how cross-sectional anatomy works. So imagine I had four muscles, one, two, three, four. Muscle number one sits, because remember function isn't about origin insertion, it's about how does it cross? Does it cross, how does it cross? Muscle number one crosses anteriorly, so it's gonna be a cervical flexor, and it crosses left laterally, so it's gonna be a left lateral cervical bender. What if I said that muscle number one, so cervical flexor is sagittal plane pull because it's, I'm looking at it, how it crosses a bilateral axis and left lateral pull is a frontal plane pull because of how it crosses the AP axis. But what about transverse? How I'm going to communicate polar axis crossing is with rotational arrows. So if muscle number one is a right transverse cervical rotator, I'm gonna draw a rotation arrow that says, hey, this muscle is trying to spin the merry-go-round this way. And let's say muscle number two does this. Hey, look, muscle number two is a left transverse cervical rotator. So that's how we communicate polar axis with rotation arrows. Remember, the arrows represent direction of pull, not necessarily the motion. For example, let's say uh, I was a kid and I was playing on the merry-go-round and my older brother, my, my brother's eight years older than me, and he's, I want to spin the merry-go-round this way, okay? I'm muscle number two. But my brother, who's bigger and stronger, he's preventing me from spinning it this way because he's just being a big brother. He's just being a jerk. And he's holding it there. And I'm trying. Come on, Jason. Let me spin the bag around. But it's not going anywhere. But I'm trying to spin it to the left. You see? Trying. This is the direction that I'm trying to rotate it. But it may not move. That's okay. Isometrics. But even though it's not moving... I'm still pulling in a direction of motion. Very important. The elevator cable still pulls up even though the elevator is stopped. Does that make sense? It's still an upward puller even though the elevator stops to let people off and take people on. Okay. So this is the breakdown of the cross section of the cervical vertebra. I'm going to pull up uh, pictures and go over the specific muscles and I'm going to explain how they pull in those directions. We'll go over some uh, origins and insertions, but, but that, I'm not going to test you on that. I'm going to test you on the important stuff, function. What does it do? What directions of pull? How would you stretch it based on 
positions that you put the neck in, knowing the directions of pull. That's the important stuff, okay? So let me scoot our buddy here, and I'm going to, won't take me long, I'm going to turn on the overhead, and we'll look at specific muscles. Be right back. Now I'm going to go turn off the light. All right, guys, let me uh, zoom out a second. shift this over okay so the first muscles i'm going to talk about is the sternocleidomastoids and uh, i'm going to talk a lot about semantics uh, so sternocleidomastoids is plural you have a sternocleidomastoid singular on the right side of your adam's apple on the right side of your body and you have a sternocleidomastoid on the left side of your body. So how do we differentiate which one we're talking about? Super duper simple. I have a right sternocleidomastoid and I have a left sternocleidomastoid. So it's, it's the same type of muscle. Hey, I have a right hand and I have a left hand. They're both hands. They're both the same thing, but not the same thing. I have a ring on my left one, right? So how do we separate left from right? We just say the right hand, the left hand. So we do the same thing for muscles. I have a right bicep and a left bicep. I have a right sternocleidomastoid and a left sternocleidomastoid. Now I'm gonna show you different views and angles, but this particular view, this anterior view, remember anterior posterior axis, an anterior view is literally kind of looking at an anterior posterior axis from its perspective. So this view really shows you function of frontal plane pull. The right is pulling right lateral and the left is pulling left lateral. Think of it as a seesaw, right? If, if, uh, if my ears kind of represent the seesaw and I have one string pulling the seesaw this way, and I have the other string pulling the seesaw the other way, okay? So sternocleidomastoids, that's a lot of syllables, but for a simple concept, it's a muscle that has an origin on the sternum, there's your sternum, and your clavicle. It has a dual origin. It has some sternal origin and some clavicle origin, clavicular origin, if we're going to be super smart. And this dual origin blends in to one common rope and it attaches on the mastoid process. Now, the mastoid process is part of your skull in the back and, and it's right by your ear. So that's why when I say pulling right ear, right shoulder, 
I don't necessarily mean your, your, your lobe, but your external auditory meatus, your little ear, ear canal right here, okay? Literally, the mastoid is right there. It, it helps form the ear canal. So you see this long sliver. It gives it some, some extra surface area to yank on and to pull. But that's it, man. That's your, your, uh, where your sternocleidomastoid's yanking and pulling. So here's the important thing. Start, finish, anterior pull. Now I'm going to get to the anterior pull in a bit. I should have just kept on to the lateral because that's what I gave you first. So right sternocleidomastoid is going to have a right sternocleidomastoid is going to have a right lateral pull. Left sternocleidomastoid is going to have a left lateral pull. Okay. So the left and right sternocleidomastoids are antagonistic, meaning they have opposite poles in the frontal plane. They do not pull in the same direction in the frontal plane. They pull in opposite directions in the frontal plane. Right? Left, right, left, like milk in a cow, right, left. In addition, they also have opposite poles in the transverse plane, and then they have synergistic poles. They have the same pole in the sagittal plane. Now, before I get into those functions, let's talk about stretch. Muscles can only pull. And we know that anything that has pull force, ropes, therabands, rubber bands, that the way you lengthen or stretch it is to position it in the opposite direction of pull. So if I had a rubber band and that rubber band was trying to pull my hands together, I'm going to stretch it by pulling my hands apart. It's that simple. So if... I would like to stretch my right sternocleidomastoid in the frontal plane, I need to know what direction of pull it does. The right sternocleidomastoid is a right lateral cervical bender. That means it's pulling right ear to right shoulder. So to stretch it, I need to have motion in the opposite direction of its pull. Left lateral cervical bending is going to stretch my right lateral cervical benders in the frontal plane. Stretch my left in the frontal plane, I need to bend to the right. Stretch the right in the frontal plane, I need to bend to the left. That's simple. So on the test, I might say, how do we stretch a right sternocleidomastoid in the frontal plane? By bending the neck to the left. Okay, that's simple. Okay, next photo. Okay, so this is an example. Let's see, the right sternal cloud master, that's after you've, you've, uh, you've, um, you've turned. Oh, I know why I have this picture, is to show you what that muscle looks like in your neck. So when you twist your neck, you got that kind of rope that kind of jets out. That's your sternocleidomastoid, okay? Go into your mastoid process. Now, what I wanted to point out here is a concept I call spirality. It's just a word I made up that, that infers a direction of spin in a transverse plane. So in her case, she's looking to her right, okay? She's looking to her right. That's her right shoulder. She's looking to her right. And this muscle right here is straight across. So what that tells me is that it's done its job. It's pulled in the transverse plane to get her to the end of the road. So imagine if this muscle was straight across, When I'm looking to the right, imagine this. When I go to look back to the left, to go back to anatomical, I've created spirality. I've created obliquity. I've created angulation. Now this muscle wants to pull me back across. I've lengthened it to give it obliqueness. Okay? 
So let me give you a better photo of the sternocleidomastoid in a transverse plane, and we'll talk about its function, and then we'll do the easiest one last, the cervical flexion pull. It's a pretty good image, and uh, there's a lot of good images online, uh, so feel free to use as you wish. The best way to describe the sternocleido, now a lot of photos are two-dimensional pictures, right? Up, down, left, right. You don't really get that depth, so that's why you got to get some different pictures that have different views so that you could see the depthness, that third dimension of a muscle like the sternocleidomastoid. So in this case, you could see how it starts more anterior than where it finishes, or it starts more posterior than where it finishes. Origin insertion is really kind of a relative term. So here's the gist in layman's terms. Let me try to explain why this muscle right here, the left sternocleidomastoid, remember lefts and right is from the perspective of the person, this person's left sternocleidomastoid. Why the left sternocleidomastoid is a right transverse cervical rotator, okay? So take a look at that muscle. Now, what I'd like for you to imagine is if you were a kid growing up and let's say uh, you were about to touch something super hot and your parent or guardian freaked out because they don't want you to get hurt and so they grab you by the ear because it's instinct they grab you by the ear and they pull it forward well imagine if you if you or someone else grabs a hold to your right ear okay i'm going to use my microphone if i pull someone's right ear and pull it anteriorly i'm sorry a left ear brian if someone pulls your left ear and pulls it forward, it's gonna make you want to look to your right in the transverse plane. Pulling my left side forward is a right transverse cervical rotator pull. It's a right transverse cervical rotation pull. And that's what's happening here. This muscle has an angle and because this, the back part, the mastoid process is more posterior than the uh, sternal and clavicle part, the sternoclavicular part, it's trying to pull the right ear forward to the sternum and the clavicle. The way I like to look at this or, or, or this concept is I set up my fingers for it. Let me, uh, all kinds of glare. I'm going to uh, be right back. Okay, so what I try to do is I'll take my fingers and I'll represent right sternocleidomastoid, left sternocleidomastoid. And then when I pull the left, it's trying to make me look to the right. And when I pull the right, it's making me want to look to the left. I'm trying to shorten, contract, bring this finger to my thumb. Left sternocleidomastoid is right transverse cervical rotation pullers. And right sternocleidomastoid is left transverse cervical rotation pullers. Where the confusion can, I could see it, is we have different rights and lefts for different planes. Right lateral is different than right transverse. Left lateral is different than left transverse. 
So the right sternocleidomastoid, now this gets confusing, but that's why you study. And that's why I give you tools like the cross-sectional anatomy to help clarify confusion. The right-sided sternocleidomastoid is a right lateral puller, but a left transverse puller. The left sternocleidomastoid is a left lateral puller, but a right transverse puller. Okay? Right lateral, left transverse. Left lateral, right transverse. Okay? So, sternocleidomastoids independently, just like someone may be a left-hander like me, and I throw with just my left hand. The right sternocleidomastoid and the left sternocleidomastoid do two things independently of each other. Frontal plane pull and transverse plane pull. So logically, there must be something they do together. And that's sagittal plane pull. Which is cool. Because if you think about it, if they're both working together to pull the mastoid processes forward, that means they are canceling out frontal and canceling out transverse, and they can work synergistically to pull forward, to cancel out frontal, cancel out transverse, and work together to pull forward. It's pretty cool, okay? So sternocleidomastoids, cervical flexors, right lateral, right lateral cervical bender, left transverse cervical rotator. Left is a cervical flexor, left lateral, right transverse. Where this gets confusing is stretch. How do I stretch my sternocleidomastoids? Extend the cervical vertebra. How do I stretch the right lateral in the frontal? Bending to the left, that's easy. The transverse is the one that, that gets us, our instincts. How do you stretch a right sterno in the transverse plane? Well, what does it do? What does it pull? Right sterno is trying to make me look to my left. So therefore, if I do this, I shorten it. You're like, what? How does that work? Here is a representation of my sternocleidomastoid. Notice the length. If I do this, notice the slack because I shortened it. I'm gonna lengthen my right sternocleidomastoid by looking to the same side. Look how I lengthened it. It got longer. Look, it, it started with this much length. And when I look to the right, I added this much length. So that's counterintuitive. We think that if I look to the right, I'm shortening it in the transverse plane, but that's not true. I'm bringing my mastoid process further away from my sternum in the transverse plane. Okay? All right. Going to the posterior muscles. This is where things get a little crazy because you got a ton of them. And the reason you have so many cervical extensors is because they need to be fatigue resistant. They need to work over long periods of time to keep you erect, to keep your cervical vertebra upright so that you can work, see, live, and then at night you rest it, right? So these muscles need to be able to handle long-term innervation above resting tone. So how do we do that? We get a bunch of them to help dissipate that work over time. That's why you get tension headaches, your, your, your neck muscles are real tight and spasm because they're on a lot, okay? They're on a lot, they're, very, they're fatigue resistant, but they can be fatigued. So what we do to try to simplify things in undergraduate is we don't talk about all of the little intrinsic and extrinsic muscles, we kind of group them into a concept called erector spinae, erecting your spine, a bunch of people, a bunch of muscles that work to prevent cervical flexion when you're upright. If you think about it, they're working isometrically a lot of times just to prevent your head from falling over. When you're about to go to sleep, your head nods, same concept. They are upright, they're keeping you erect so that you don't fall over. Okay, here's how these guys work practically at the neck. 
Here's your spine. I would like to think of the spine as a great wall, a great barrier where muscles do not cross over. Okay, muscles do not cross over. So in other words, you have right-sided erectors and you have left-sided erectors. Left side of the spine, right side of the spine. And their function is almost the exact same as the sternocleidomastoids, meaning that the left-sided erector is going to pull left ear, left shoulder, and the right-sided erector is going to go right ear, right shoulder. In addition, there's a mirror effect where your sternocleidomastoids are pulling anterior, pulling in a direction of cervical flexion, where your erectors are posterior crossing muscles to the neck and the spine. So they're going to pull in a direction of cervical extension, pulling on the back of my cap. Cervical flexors in the front, cervical extensors in the back. The left-sided ones are going to be also left lateral. The right-sided ones right lateral. Here's where things really get different. So look at that photo here, and you notice that a lot of these muscles start more in the midline and go out more towards the mastoid process, which is more lateral. So if you look at the way my fingers are crossing for the left erector spinae, notice this obliquity, this angulation that we have here that's naturally occurring more towards the midline to away towards the midline. So what that is practically, so what, Campbell? So what? What does that mean? Well, anterior muscles are pulling your ear forward, but posterior muscles are pulling your ear back. So this analogy would be if you're about to do something silly, like touch a hot stove, and your parent or guardian or older brother or sister grabs pinches your left ear and pulls it back, what direction are you going to try to look to the left? In other words, if I pull my left ear posterior, it's making me want to look to the left. So the left erector spinae is a left transverse cervical rotation puller. And the right sternocleidomastal, I'm sorry, the right erector spinae is a right transverse cervical rotation puller. So these kind of match up all together. The left erector, left lateral, and left transverse. The right erector, right lateral, and right transverse. It's kind of cool. I just broke this guy's jaw. Sorry. All right. Let's get to cross-sectional anatomy and how this can work for you. I'm going to pull up another slide. Be right back. Okay, so this slide that I'm pulling up is part of your support materials uh, on Moodle. Okay, so this is your cross-sectional uh, circle for the cervical vertebra. All righty, there she is. Let's see. Okay, so cervical vertebra. Look at that. That's your little key. The bilateral axis separates flexors from extensors. Flexors, extensors are separated by the bilateral axis. Now, of course, this point is your spine, and I know your spine is more posterior, but this is just to help separate things and be consistent with other joints of the body, okay? But that's your spine, represents your spine. Anterior crossing muscles, cervical flexors. Posterior crossing muscles, cervical extensors. These are your erector spinae. Anterior posterior axis separates my right lateral cervical benders from my left lateral cervical benders. Right ear, right shoulder, left ear, left shoulder. 
left ear, left shoulder, right ear, right shoulder. And then the polar axis separates my right transverse cervical rotators from my left transverse cervical rotators. So if you think about it, these guys work together in the sagittal plane. These guys work together in the sagittal plane. These guys work together in the frontal plane. These guys work together in the frontal plane. So what's left? These guys work together in the transverse plane. These guys work together in the transverse plane. Because if you think about it, if you were playing with kids on a merry-go-round and you really wanted to spin the merry-go-round efficiently, you would use what we call in mechanics a force couple. Two different straight line forces that actually work together to spin something. So you have an antero right lateral muscle that's trying to spin the merry-go-round the exact same as a posterior left lateral muscle. So they have two different straight line directions of pull, but yet they have the same rotational. Layman's terms, if someone pulls my right ear forward at the same time they pull my left ear back, I'm going to get a much better efficient torque of my neck to make me twist to the left. That's all that means. So let's talk about what you can get from learning this circle. And there's a key on the bottom that has all the different muscle names. So here we abbreviate why to save space. Okay. So if you're, someone's talking about the sternocleidomastoids, you could just imagine well, where do they sit in class? Oh, they sit anterior, they're cervical flexors. Oh, the right sits on the right side of class, so it's a right lateral. But when it comes to rotation, oh, it's trying to spin, it's trying to pull this way to make me look to the left. So the right sternocleidomastoid, not memorizing lists, but by understanding its function based on how it crosses, is a cervical flexor, right lateral cervical bender, left transverse cervical rotator. All because I know where it sits in the neck and its directions of pull. How would I stretch the right sternocleidomastoid? When the sagittal plane, I need to extend. And in the frontal plane, I need to bend to the left. And in the transverse plane, I need to look to the right. Make sense? Okay. What's the function of the left erector spinae? The left erector spinae is a cervical extensor, a left lateral cervical bender, and a left transverse cervical rotator, meaning that it pulls in those directions. How would I stretch the left erector spinae? When well, the sagittal plane, I need a flex. In the frontal plane, I need a right lateral. And in the transverse plane, I need to right transverse. Now, the reason that's important to know the different planes is combinational stretching, right? In other words, if you know that the left erector spinae has multiple functions, then you know that if you're really trying to get it a good stretch, not only do you need to go forward, but you need to go to the side. A combinational motion, forward and lateral at the same time, is going to lengthen it more than just one or the other. Okay? So there's a lot of cool information that you can get by just learning the circle, by just learning where things fit. If you try to do this with lists, you can, but it gets super confusing because what you would have to do is you'd have to make a list for cervical flexors, cervical extensors, right lateral cervical benders, left lateral cervical benders, right transverse lateral. So you'd have six columns and you'd, you'd have several muscles listed several times in the columns. So your cervical flexors, you'd have these guys, cervical extensors, right lateral. And then you'd notice, wait, 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 this muscle is with this one here, but it's with another one there, and it, it gets very confusing. Whereas a cross-sectional approach, you just have to list them once and see the different functions. If you do lists, you have multiple functions with multiple muscles. Here, you have all of that information just listed once. And then all you got to do is see direction of pull. Okay? All right. Practice for exercises. Doing manual resistance because it's hard to find uh, cervical exercises in the gym. External force is 
trying to push me this way. I'm on a chair. I'm doing rehab. External force trying to push my neck this way. External force is trying to left laterally bend me. I need to recruit my right lateral cervical benders, the ones that pull against it, right? Who are the right lateral cervical benders? That's what biomechanics is about, teaching you who are those muscles in that group. Well, those are the ones that are pulling my right ear to my right shoulder, the right sternum cladomastoid, right erector spine. What if I did it eccentrically? Still external force doing this way, but I allow left lateral cervical bending. Well, guess what? It's still the same muscles. That is why we don't say the right sternocleidomastoid's function is right lateral cervical bending. That's not its function. Its function is pulling this way. But this muscle that pulls this way can allow motion the other way through eccentric work. Okay? Right? What if, what if a therapist was trying to twist my neck? They're like, hey, I'm going to push on your cheek. Don't let me push you this way. They're trying to make me look to the right, but I'm using muscles that pull back to the left. So I'm using my left transverse cervical rotators through isometric work. Who are those muscles? That's when you visualize your circle. And you say, who are my left sternocleido, I'm sorry, who are my left transverse cervical rotators? My right sternocleidomastoid pulls that way, and my left erector spine. See how that works? This circle doesn't tell you if something is working. 310 taught you that. This circle tells you who is working once you identify what group is working. Once you figure out the agonistic group, this functional circle helps communicate who is in that group. This doesn't tell you anything about eccentrics and concentrics. This tells you direction of pull of muscles. Okay? All right, guys. Y'all have a good weekend. Obviously, hit me up if y'all have any questions or clarifications.